And we're going to read verses 1 to 8 together. Revelation 21, 1 to 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity. He will live with them. They'll be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. He also said, Right, because these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I'll freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. The one who conquers will inherit these things. I'll be his God and he'll be my son. But the cowards, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulphur, which is the second death. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I still remember uh, the first time I listened to Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech, I Have a Dream. Uh, It was actually a Bible college in first year as we were doing doctrine and our lecturer took us through a number of great speeches that gave a vision for the future. Uh, If you haven't ever had the chance to listen to it, please do this week. Uh, It is spine-tingling. It's full of memorable lines Uh, It has a number of emotional highs and really withering lows. Uh, It lays out a vision for America. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the colour of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today, one day right here in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. In many ways, it remains a dream, doesn't it? If you've been following the media in this last month, the death of Tyre Nichols in Memphis exposes that. A young black man beaten to death by five black police officers. It remains a dream because of so many factors. Everything from the personal lifestyle of Martin Luther King Jr. through to the nature of change in society, right through to our very own human hearts. There are many such dreams in human existence, aren't there? Just think about our lifetime. Al-Qaeda wanting to create an Islamic state stretching right through the Middle East through to a man called Bob Hawke standing at the Opera House saying, no Australian child will live in poverty by 1990. Many of those dreams are admirable. Almost all of them fail. Can there be a vision of the future that is not a dream? Can there be a vision of the future that is so certain now that we can call it reality? I think for Christians there can be and there is. And God's word says so. Let me pray and we're going to look at it together. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech is spine-tingling, but Revelation 21 is even more because of its certainty. Father, as we sit here in the comfort of the coolness of this day, remind us of the refreshment of this certainty and send us out into a world that is so thirsty with this vision that is based on the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. Send us out to invite others in. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, In this series, The Good Life, as Stephen's reminded us, we've been looking at it over, this is the sixth week. Uh, There's always been a future aspect to what we've been doing as God's people. Uh, With our lives hidden with Christ, that's the first sermon. We look forward to a day when Jesus will return and we'll see him as the most significant thing in all history. As people who are being sanctified, that was sermons two and three. We're looking forward to the day when Positional sanctification and progressive sanctification uh, give birth to perfected sanctification. We actually are 
as we are. When we walk as a community of grace, that was the fourth sermon, we walk together towards a future. And as people who confront our sin, that was the fifth sermon, we look forward to a day when the greatest lawyer in history will speak for us before God. Revelation, the last book of the Bible, gives us one of the most fulsome descriptions of what that future is like. Um, That point two on the outline, it's a book many people are fascinated with, isn't it? It's a book that many people misunderstand. It's really vibrant in colour and imagery. Uh, Let me tell you, it's really simple at its heart. Here are the two keys to understanding Revelation. It's understandable. It's as simple as that. The first readers understood it without going to Bible college and without any Bible commentaries. It can be understood. Secondly, whatever it says must be interpreted by the rest of the Bible. Let me give you an example. If Jesus says the Son of Man doesn't know the day when the world will end, why would we expect God to give us a whole book with a timeline telling us the day when the world will end? You've got to handle Revelation in light of the rest of the Bible. And the rest of the Bible is about a bloke called Jesus, and he's the heart of the book of Revelation. The, the first eight verses unpack that. It's a revelation of God about Jesus. Who's Jesus? He's the faithful witness to God. He's the firstborn from the dead. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth, chapter 1, verse 5. Jesus loves his people. Jesus has set them free from sin by his blood. Jesus has made them a mob to show the world who God is like, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. That Jesus is coming back, chapter 1, verse 7. That's the heart of Revelation. Here's Jesus. So as his mob persists in showing him to the world, here's Jesus, and as his mob persists in showing him to the rest of the world. Chapters 2 and 3 are all about that. Letters to the seven churches, really letters to the whole of God's mob across history, persevere. There's a repeated phrase there at the end of them, conquer or be victorious, grind away so that you can show the world who King Jesus is when everything finishes. And it's written so that God's people know who's in control. Remember, we're talking about AD 60 to 90. Who's in control? He's a bloke called Caesar who presents a certain vision of the future that is all Roman. At a time when God's mob are starting to be persecuted, John's taken up in Revelation 4 to 5 to the cockpit of the universe. And when he gets there, he sees God on the throne of all things. In God's right hand, he holds a scroll. That's all of history. No one can open it. John's in tears. And then suddenly, someone comes forward to open it. It's the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, who looks like a slaughtered lamb. It's Jesus. And Jesus trots out, takes that scroll, and he starts to undo it. And so we see a snapshot of all of history from the cockpit of the universe, Revelation 6 to 20. And it shows time and time again from different aspects that there is a great pretender and God has already beaten him. And the book finishes in Revelation 21 to 22 with this marvellous vision that we're going to spend a moment looking at now. I'm at point three on the outline. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream. John had a vision. And when I came over this morning to open the church, it was really stuffy. You know how a building is when you've had it closed up over a long, hot day? I opened that back door and then I opened that door and you could actually feel the breeze just rush into the building. It was delicious. That's what this is. There's just been a great cosmic war where the power of heaven has been challenged by the power of the devil and war is bloody and dusty and violent and loud. God has won and suddenly this fresh wind comes into the universe. This fresh vision. It's a vision of a new community. That's the idea of a city, a whole mob of people living together. It's a vision of a new world. Did you see there that the old is gone and there is something new? 
Heaven and earth aren't separated, but they're integrated. Uh, it's completely new, though not disconnected from the old. You can recognise it. Uh, it's new not in time, but in quality. It's not broken or frail or violent or sorrowful. Uh, it's a vision of a world that is bright and sparkling and beautiful. Did you see the images there of a bride on her wedding day? On, on a wedding day, you, you, never, you never spend the whole time at the start of the service watching the bride walk down. You want to see what she's like and then you look at the, the groom, don't you? And the look on his face as his wife-to-be walks down and the look on his face is just, wow, wow. That's the image here. It's a vision of a world that is a promise kept. As this new community comes down, you can almost see all the pennies drop in John's mind. He goes, God's just done what he said. A God in Isaiah 65 said he would make a new heaven and a new earth. And as John sees this vision, and notice that the vision comes down. Notice John doesn't go up to heaven. Notice the vision is brought down to him. He goes, God's just done as he promised. So here is this vision of the future. Here is a new community from God prepared by God. Did you notice that? This new community isn't there because the government has a new education policy. This community isn't there because the world has suddenly become more enlightened. This community isn't there because we've finally worked out the problem of the environment. Now, this community is there because of who? Because of God. God has done something that a broken world could not comprehend or deserve. God has shown his grace by creating a new future. Uh, as that creation descends, you'll notice that someone speaks. Look there in verse 3. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity. He will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Describes a future that is real now. Did you notice the tense there? God's dwelling is with humanity. It's present. It's as good as here. And please understand the significance of that idea of dwelling. In fact, that's a word that's right through the Bible. That's what we heard in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, isn't it? God dwelling with his mob. And did you notice in Mackenzie's reading uh, that God doesn't dwell with his mob? Do you notice that God gathers his people in Exodus 20 to come and live with him on a mountain? God then says in Leviticus 26 and Exodus 25, I want to live with you guys forever. That's his plan for humanity, his people. And do you notice when we open John's account of Jesus' life, Jesus dwells with his mob, John 1.14. God's desire has always been to live with his people. And that's what he accomplishes. And it is so, so lovely, isn't it? Can you imagine God reaching out his index finger and just brushing your tears away? It's a wonderful image, isn't it? But God just wipes the tears away and your knees won't ache and the anxiety and the grief and tears that you have had for your life will be removed. And it is such a good future. And do you see why it is in verse 4? Death will exist no longer. Death will exist no longer. How magnificent is that? How magnificent is that? It describes the moment where the barrier between God hanging out with his mob forever is removed. The barrier of what? The barrier of sin. It's sin that removes people from the presence of God. It's sin that brings the judgment of death from God. It's sin that's broken the fabric of this world from God. It's sin that's brought pain and grief and crying. It's sin that defines the old world, the attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. And just as John started 
at the beginning of Revelation. God has beaten that in the life, death, and resurrection of his son. That son is alive and seated next to God himself, unfolding all of history. Can anything change that objective fact? Can anyone reach into heaven and put Jesus back in the tomb? Can anyone go back and put him back on the cross? Can anyone go back and whack him back into the manger? You can't change it, can you? That objective truth is there, which tells us that this is a reality, not just a dream, but a truth. And then God himself speaks. Look at verse 5. Then the one seated on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. He also said, right, because the words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I'll freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. The guarantee, God himself. Do you notice, and I know this sounds really picky, but it's worth noticing little details. Do you notice the three tenses God uses there? When's he making it new? Now. Today. But do you notice what he says about its completion? It's already finished. When did it finish? Finished at the cross, didn't it? Sin was paid for at the cross. The snake was crushed at the cross. God gave his people what they did not deserve at the cross. God can dwell with his mob because of the cross. And then do you notice the future? There is a day when you'll taste all of that stuff that's finished in all of its goodness in its vibrancy, in its colour. There is a day when you will be able to walk out and say, there's no more death. There's no more anxiety. There's no more grief. There's no more pain. Why? Because God has done it. Do you see his description of himself? I'm the bookend of the alphabet. Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end of all time. And you can actually go back through the Bible and trace so many themes from Revelation 21 through the rest of the Bible. God said, I'm going to remove the curse of sin from the world through the family of Abraham. Genesis 12, did he do it? He did it in Jesus. God said, I want to live with his, with my mob. Did he do it? He did it in Jesus. God promised to restore life to his people. Ezekiel 37, did he do it? He did it in Jesus. People are thirsty in the desert. God gives them water. Jesus promises water that would never run out in John chapter 3. Will he do it then? He does it in Jesus. God says it. God's character guarantees it. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus subjectively show it's true in history. Who's in charge? God himself. And that God finishes in verses 7 to 8 with an encouragement and a warning. The one who conquers will inherit these things. I'll be his God, he'll be my son. But the cowards, the faithless, detestable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Do you see that phrase there, conquerors? That ends all of the seven letters in Genesis 2 and 3 in Revelation 2 and 3. It's a phrase that says, persevere, win, plug away, and this is what you'll get. And you see that word for coward there? It's only used twice more in the Bible, Matthew 8, 26 and Mark 4, 40. Each time it's used, it describes someone who says, I I know Jesus is true, but I'm not going to stand up for him. And so you bring these two together, the one seated on the throne, God says, plug away, persevere, run from sin, and you'll inherit all of this, receiving what I've achieved in Jesus. And God says from the throne, those who know about Jesus but will not stand up for him or live with him as Lord and Saviour, They're not going to be in this city. Heaven is for those whose lives are hidden with Christ, persevering for him. Heaven is not for those who know the truth and say, I know better. 
There's no denying that this is a marvellous vision for the future, is there? I'm at the last point on your outline. There's a new world, there are tears wiped away, there's no death, God's mob dwells with mob with God. Sin is beaten, there is certainty, and it's reached its glorious end point, this living for Jesus. But let me finish by asking you, what will it look like tomorrow morning? What will it look like on Tuesday and Wednesday as the kids go back to school? What will it look like at the end of the week when we've finally got week one done? Well, let me ask you five very simple questions. You've already got the answers. I gave you the answers. They're there on your outline. What's the centre of the future you look forward to this week? What's at its heart? What is so common about so many dreams and forever stories that we build now is that we structure them around people and things that fail. We depend on ourselves. You can be whatever you want to be. We rely on public policy, whether it's education or the protection of my rights or even the environment. We even turn to force. The biggest gun or army will guarantee my future. All of those fail, don't they? Who is the one who doesn't fail? Well, you've got the answer there. It is God. How do we view access to the future we'll look forward to this week? Uh, In many ways, we base it around three things. We earned it through work. We deserve it through rights. We inherited it through our family or national connections. But do you know what? They will all fail, won't they? Our work will collapse as we collapse. My rights will compete with your rights and we'll fight. My inheritance gets chewed up by greed or moths, doesn't it? The foundation of the vision for the future for God's people is grace, isn't it? That's why it's so certain, because it depends on God doing it, not us. Nothing could be more certain. Thirdly, how good is the future we look forward to tomorrow? The futures we create are often so limited, aren't they? They've got elements of goodness, but they're often limited to economic advancement or educational equality, getting a piece of dirt or building the house we always wanted. They're limited to a decaying planet. Do you notice how extensive and expansive and expensive God's vision is? It'll take a heart and change it. It'll take an image and restore it. It will take brokenness and give perfection. It will take sin and give righteousness. It will take death and banish it. And it's all utterly immovable, isn't it? Because no one will put Jesus back on the cross. Fourthly, how easy is the future we look forward to? That's one of the catches around the world's visions of the future. They always want to give us something that's so easy, don't they? Maybe this is where Martin Luther King Jr. got it right. Such a vision comes through persistence and perseverance, living as you are. That's the image of the conqueror. It's the image of an athletic contest where you have sweated blood and tears and you have actually persisted. And we've seen that, haven't we, the daily decisions about sin? Persistence. There's a phrase there, it's on your outline. It it can be a grind, can't it? It can be a grind, those daily decisions, living as you are. But how good is that future? Martin Luther King Jr. spoke to millions, and it's still a dream. We have a vision, and it's a reality. Is that good news? Is that something to proclaim and share? Or is it something to hide and to hoard? It is good news, isn't it? And we can start sharing it tomorrow morning. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks for this certain vision of the future that is real because of Jesus. Father, make this our vision. Help us to be people who proclaim this goodness to all those we meet so that they can join us in that city by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.